that the speech of Allah can be contained on the pages of a book is incarnational. You, you, you muddied that by saying that I'm a one-trick pony. You know, I could have said you're a one-trick pony all along, but I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to fall to your level. This is something which is not very difficult to understand. But for Bob, in order to do this, he has to invent a new word called energy. Where does these energies come from? But the same verse says that the word that was given to Mariam, whose name is Isa the Messiah. Well, why does a word of Allah have a name? I, we can cut and thrust along long, lots of different angles. Okay. Um, do you want to time it? Like timed four minutes, four minutes, or three minutes, three minutes? Yeah, let's let's do it naturally, like we normally do. Uh, I ju I'm just <laughs> conscious that the last time the conversation broke down. Yeah. Let's. If it does, then we can do time. Okay. Okay, but we're agreed. If the conversation, that the order of a conversation breaks down, we'll resort to timing. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So we try to do it. Um, let's see if we can both be civilized. Yeah. <laughs> Keep it like keep it simple to the point. So we discuss one point at a time. No machine gun tactics. I want to do the same, and I'm hoping you want to do the same. Okay, same. fair enough. Alright, so we. Yep. We deal. Okay. So you want to start? Or? I don't know. Um, this is your topic. Okay. Fire away. So basically, uh, Bob and I we have agreed to discuss the nature of God uh, in Islam and in Christianity. So we're going to contrast and um, discuss the two based on. Our faith, our religion, based on the Quran, based on the Bible, or, um, obviously uh, other sources like the Hadith, and I'm sure you got the uh, uh, the patristic uh, sources and so on. So let's start with um, God's existence. So I would say that Allah is the one who exists without any one. Um, Independently, that means Allah exists independently. Okay, which we call a summit in Surah Al Ikhlas. Yeah. Yeah, Allah is summit. In Christianity, I wonder if the concept of God which you have, yes, is God independent or does he need someone to generate him or someone to bring him into existence, whether it's eternally or non eternally? How is it? Is it dependent or independent? Okay. So, Christians believe that God is and always has been Father, Son and Holy Spirit. God in Christian monarchial language refers to the Father. And a hypostatic property of the Father is that he begets the Son. Now this happens outside of time. It doesn't have a beginning. There's no point at which it begins. There's no point at which it ends. Imagine it as a frozen picture. It's not something that starts somewhere or ends somewhere. It just always is in every moment of time. And even before time and even after time, the father begets the son. So there's no transience, there's no change, there's no... But we describe hypostatically the property of the father as begetting the son, which means that in every conceivable world, the father is always the father because the father cannot change. And as the Father is always the Father, He is always the Father of the Son. Which means that the Son exists in every conceivable world, because God can't change. So... Okay, so basically it's contingent on the Father for His existence, whether it's eternally or, or not. The thing is, the Father is always the one who is a saint. The Son is not, because the property of a saity, the term a saity means someone who is self-sufficient, self-existing without he's self-existing independently without any anyone other than himself so if i have i don't know if, if that is a definition you agree with then based on what you said it seems like the father is the only one who is who possesses this attribute of a satiety of self-sufficient existing independently without anyone other than himself but the son is dependent on the Father, and I believe by extension the Holy Spirit, who is spirated by the Father as well, just like the Son is generated by the Father. So both of them, the Holy Spirit and the Son, they do not possess 
the great making property of Aseti, which is absolutely, I would say, it is, it is, it is by necessity, God is Aseti, that he is self-existing, self-sufficient, without the need for anyone else for his existence. Okay, so allow me to try and address um, Hashim's point, because what Hashim is trying to suggest through the use of language, and I don't blame him, because human language is a temporal thing, we exist in a temporal way, we conceive in a temporal way, and so our linguistics use temporal categories. So, when we speak of God, Thomas Aquinas says that we speak via analogy. Analogy does not mean that the language that we use exactly encapsulates God's reality in and of itself. That there is a distinction, a falling away between our language and its ability to describe God and the reality of God himself. So Hashim is right that a hypostatic property of the Father is that he is uncaused, which is the actual proper definition of a seity. Now the language of caused and uncaused implies temporality. So we have to qualify the language and say that the language is deficient to describe God, including the word aseity itself. The Father generates the Son, but this generation of the Son, so he's right, the hypostatic quality of aseity belongs to the Father, it does not belong to the Son, but this does not imply that the Son comes into being at some point, that at some point the Son begins to exist. This is not what we Christians believe. We Christians believe that God has always been Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Allow me to use a picture analogy to capture what I want and then I'll, I'll return the conversation to Hashim. Okay. Imagine, and this is just a, a, a thought exercise. Don't be childish, don't take it literally. It's a thought exercise to capture an idea. If I place three books upon a desk, the second book and the third book depend in their position upon the first book because they're piled on top of one another. But now imagine in this picture metaphor that these books have always been that way. There was never a point where they became that way. They've always been that way and there'll never be a point when they're not that way. We can say in one breath that the position of the first, second and third book depend upon the first. But it in no way implies the idea that one causes temporally the other to exist. And I hope you understand the distinction that I've made there. Yeah, but the analogy doesn't really fit. I mean, what we are talking about is the Christians say that the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit Yes, so talking about language, we already talked about father, which to me is like for a father to be a father and for a son to be a son, one precedes the other. The father always precedes the son. So if you're going to talk about language, the church uses ambiguous or uh, I would say confusion. It adds confusion to someone who is supposed to be co-equal. We all know that the father precedes the son in a day-to-day -day language. So if you're going to use the language as a problem, then the church has a problem because the church uses this confusing language of the father and the son. So my point I'm trying to make here is that if you're going to insist that the father is co-equal to the son, which I believe the Nicene Creed states, then the nature of a city should be with both the father and with the son as well. But since Bob has already clearly admitted that the son does not possess the nature of aseity and by extension the Holy Spirit doesn't possess the nature of aseity meaning they both are caused using the word that you use causation is there for both the Son and the Holy Spirit and the one who causes them or brings them into causation whatever however you want to put it okay is the father the father is the origin that means the Almighty God who brings these two these two wouldn't exist Yes, so even if they were eternally caused, the fact remains that they were caused by someone who was not caused himself. The uncreated, the uncaused almighty God is the Father. Okay, so what we understand from what Hashim is doing is he's trying to crowbar temporality 
into the sequence. And the thing is, he says that the church has a problem because it uses language that is problematic. But what he may fail to understand is that I said that Thomas Aquinas already identified that language is problematic. And this is not something unique or particular to the Christian faith. Muslims themselves say that God is not like anything that he has created. Which means that when the Quran describes Allah with hands or eyes or feet or a shin, when he's described with two right hands as in the hadiths, or he's described as descending into the lowest heaven, Hashim will appeal to the fact that these words do not have an equivalence in the created order. And I am saying that causality when speaking about God in that the Son is generated of the Father is not equivalent equal to causality in the temporal world. Now, I, I, I'm going to hand the conversation back to Hashim, but I just want to point out something. I was speaking to a Muslim earlier today. And I pointed out that in a verse of the Quran, it says, and remember when we sent an angel unto Maryam to bring her glad tidings of a word from Allah, whose name is Isa the Messiah. Now, this Muslim, to get out of the paradox that this creates, stated that God's speech is not eternal. If the word that Allah sends to Maryam is eternal, it proceeds from Allah, does that proceeding from Allah happen eternally? Okay, so you haven't answered about the co-equality, so maybe you'll do that the next time. I said, if the Father is equal in nature to the Son, then the Father and the Son, they should both have this property of aseity, that means they should be able to generate. So if the son, imagine if the father can generate the son, can the son generate a grandson? Okay, because if you're going to use language and if you're going to use that to describe the ontological nature of the father and the son, then the co-equality has no meaning if the language doesn't fit what you're trying to describe here. As for your understanding about God's speech being eternal, yes, the attributes of Allah are eternal. However, however, Allah's actions, that means when he speaks, yes, the speech itself is uncreated, but he speaks in time, obviously. So when he tells something to Mary, or when he says to his messenger to Mary, or to Jesus, or to anybody else, yes, obviously that is in, in time and that is not eternal, but it's still uncreated, okay, in the sense that all attributes of Allah are uncreated. And what we have to realize is that, so the sifat, the sifat of zatiya, which is like when you talk about the essence of Allah, for example, his knowledge. The knowledge of Allah is something which we know. He knows everything. He is all-knowing. He is omniscient. However, in the case of, of the Christianity, like for example, once the son has incarnated, he becomes ignorant of the last hour, which he says only the father knows. Hence, it excludes the Holy Spirit as well. So we got two attributes of Allah. One is, I mean, two categories of the attributes of Allah. One is Sifat al which is his essence, which we know is eternal and uncreated. But in the case of Sifat al, uh, what do you say, Fa'aliyah, which is the actions, then that can be, it's the, the Sifat or the attribute is still uncreated, but it can happen in time. Okay, so it speaks in time, obviously. It creates in time. So we know these things. Right. So here's the problem. No, no, it's not a problem, actually. What Hashim has done is exactly what Christians do. We make a distinction between what we call the hypostatic properties of the persons, that is those distinguishable marks of the persons. The Father is distinguishable from the Son. The Son is distinguishable from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is distinguishable from the Father. That's one category. And then we have another category, which is the oasis, the essence of God. That is something that is unknowable, unapproachable, transcendent, indescribable. And so Hashim has introduced categories that we also use. Now, if it is acceptable for Hashim to introduce two kinds of categories to describe God's actions and God, his, his, his person within himself, 
then it's also acceptable for me to introduce two categories, though these two categories are different. I'm not talking about temporality and intemporality, I'm talking about the oesis and the hypostasis, something that Hashim is very aware of that we Christians make that distinction and always have done. This is not a rhetorical device. Now, I note that Hashim didn't address my question. I will address his question about the co-equality. What do we mean by the co-equality? We are saying that that oasis, that essence, that unapproachable glory that is indescribable by the words of men, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit have it completely and identically. We do not say that the Father is the Son. Why? Because the Father has begotten the Son. We do not say that the Father is the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Aseity is an attribute of the hypostasis, not of the oesis. And their equality is couched in the oesis, not in the hypostasis. Now, Hashim, I would like you to answer my question. Allah speaks. His word proceeds to Mary. That proceeding, if Allah is eternal, that word also is eternal. Is that proceeding eternal or does Allah change? Okay, so just correct me. Hypostasis means persons, right? Yes. Okay, so you said the aseity is attributed to the person. Yes. And that is the father. Yes. That means the son doesn't have aseity. We, we don't say that the son has aseity. Good, so you're agreeing with me then? Yes. So we do, we stating be... what Christians believe well, is not to... an argument okay. against Christianity. That's just that. stating so, what Christians believe. So when, you, when I said the ontologically, the father is not same in nature to the son. Okay? I'm not saying their essence. I'm talking about the persons. The two persons, the father and the son, the father has an extra attribute, a property called aseity, self-existing, self-sufficient, independent the son is dependent on the father for his personal for his person to exist even yes because he's, he proceeds from the father and similarly the holy spirit also proceeds from the father well depending if you are the catholic or protestant or you are the orthodox because i believe the orthodox church has a different understanding that the holy spirit proceeds not from the father but from the holy spirit sorry from the son Okay, so they have a different, they have sort of a division with, in, in Christianity about the belief. Now you, you mentioned about the speech, I think I've already answered that, I've already addressed that. You said I, I, know you didn't. I, I said we have two categories, okay? I didn't say we have essence and a person, like the way you said. That is not even a category. That's talking about the subject itself. The essence talks about the, the, the person, what kind of essence he has. So it's not two categories like the way you said. So it's a false equivalent for you to suggest that it is a category. In Islam, we have a category for the sifat. So what is the subject here? The attributes of Allah. We have two categories. One is the adhatiya, which is his essence, which cannot be changed, which is always eternal and which is always uncreated. Like for example, his knowledge and so on. So these things are always with him. He's a city, okay? But in the case of Jesus, like I said, when he became incarnated, his omniscience did not exist. His omnipotence did not exist. His immortality did not exist. All those he had to give away, like he says in Philippians 2 6, that he became nothing. Yes, he became nothing, and he had to give up all these. He became a servant to whom? To even man, because he washed the feet of his disciples. Yes, so anyway, what I'm saying is when you talk about the categories of the attribute, one is Fali, yeah, which is like in actions, like when he speaks, he speaks in time. When he's his essence of uh, that, yeah, which is his essence, it remains consistent all the time. So there's no limit to time, space or anything. Yes, like his existence, his knowledge, all these things are, are attributed or uh, attributed to his, uh, what do you say, his essence. That is, I hope that answers your question. Okay, just changing the battery. Yeah, sure, no problem. Okay, so once again, um, Hashim is trying to introduce something that we Christians deny. This idea that the sun at some point existed. In every conceivable world, the Father is always the Father. And therefore, the Son is always the Son. 
It doesn't begin in time and it doesn't begin in place. It always is. Now, we have no problem with a seity belonging to the hyper, uh, as a property of the, uh, the hypostasis of the Father. We've got no problem with that. Simply stating what Christians believe as if it's some kind of criticism of what Christians believe is not a criticism. It's just a statement of fact. Now I notice that I've asked Hashim twice to answer the question whether the procession of the word of Allah is eternal. Because Allah is eternal, his speech is eternal. Or is it something that happens in time? If it happens in time as he said that it does, then that means that God has moved from potentiality to actuality. And if God has moved from potentiality to actuality, then that God means that God has transitioned. And if God has transitioned, he is not intransient, he is changeable, just like a creature is changeable. And that's why I wanted him to say whether it happened in time or not. And he said it happened in time. And that means that the speech of Allah that is eternal, uh, an, an, an attribute of Allah that Allah always has, has changed, it has transitioned, it has moved from place to place. <clears throat> and my next question would be that the same verse says that the word that was given to Mariam, whose name is Isa the Messiah. Well, why does a word of Allah have a name? I'd like you to answer that question, Hashim. Okay, so he said I did not answer his question, and then he said I answered his question, saying that it happened in time. So you're contradicting yourself, Bob, I don't know why. So for you to say that I said something like Allah has transitioned, that is completely and utterly false, because I never said that, never implied that. When I said the different categories of the attributes of Allah, the attributes of Allah of his essence, that means his that never changes, yes? Whereas his speech is something that he obviously has since eternity, yes, but he speaks to people. In time? Of course. So that's it proceeds that's from why I said, Listen, that's why I said there are two categories. One is his essence, which remains eternal, uncreated. Another, which happens in time. So it's still uncreated, but happens in time. So Allah has to act in time. For example, you believe your God created, right? Did he have the attribute of creation since eternity? Do you want me to answer that? Yes. Can I then speak? Yes. Okay. So he asked me the question, do we attribute, do we give as God an attribute the creator for all time, as in before time? The answer to that question is no. We make a distinction between the energies of God and God in himself, the intrinsic and extrinsic qualities of God. Now I notice that Hashim is trying to employ orthodox theology to defend Islamic God. Now I find that as a compliment. I'm complimented that Hashim is using our paradigm to defend his religion. But the problem is that the 99 attributes of Allah are said to be eternal to Allah. Allah doesn't change. Allah is the creator, so that means that Allah has eternally been the creator. How can you be the creator before you create something? It makes no logical sense. Okay. An Islamic theology doesn't make any sense. They don't have the right categories, they don't make the right distinctions. And I am genuinely flattered that he's trying to use Christian concepts to defend Allah, but it simply doesn't work. So, so Bob on one hand is saying that we have no categories. We use orthodox Islam. Uh, I said Christian, wrong Christian categories. categories. And then he's saying we are using their categories. Why? I mean, either we have... Uh, are you going to interrupt while I'm talking? Go on. So what I'm saying is this. Look, it's very simple. I made it quite clear several times now. Allah's attributes are divided into categories and this is the last time I'm going to do it so I don't like repeating myself. If you didn't get it the first three times then there's definitely something wrong here. So let me tell you once again the categories of Allah are eternal, sorry, are, are uncreated but they are divided into two categories 
eternal and non-eternal. The non-eternals in the sense that Allah uncreated speech or uh, attribute of, of, uh, of speech is uncreated, but he speaks in time of his name. Remember Bob said that his God did not have the attribute of ability to create since eternity. So I'm assuming he changed his nature from being someone who was unable to create then to be able to create when he created the creation. Similarly, he was unable to maybe talk before creation. I don't know. Maybe you, you're thinking is talking to the Trinity for eternity. But then he also talked to the creation at some time. Yes. Similarly, we have the attribute of mercy, forgiveness. Did God, was God always forgiving from eternity? Or did he become forgiving during some course of his creation. Can I answer that? Yes, uh, after I finish. So what I'm saying is that these attributes of God, we believe that God is all loving, God is merciful, God is someone who talks. He has the attribute of um, uh, uh, knowledge in the sense that he's all knowing. So all these things we know that God possesses since eternity. When he, I think the biggest mistake that Bob is making here and he will realize why I think it's illogical is that because he thinks in order for someone to possess an attribute, he has to express it. Now this is something that is his premise. Yes, I would like to know why that is something which is necessary for God or for anyone. For example, if there was a man in space, Hashim, let's see you're making the, too many points. Man. Well, I make my final point. Let's say in space, he's, he's in the space station. Yes, he can be a loving person, even though there are no other people in the space station. Yes, he's far away from humanity. But can he? Does he stop being merciful? Does he stop being loving? Does he stop being uh, just? Because according to him, God even maybe doesn't have the property of justice since eternity. So allow me to reply. The reason why, the, the, what you've got to understand, guys, is that our description of God as Christians is different from the Islamic description of God. So that is why, that is why he is using the wrong categories to describe his own religion. So the essence energy distinction that we make as Christians can't be co-opted by Hashim because the Quran and Sunni Orthodox Islam teaches that the 99 attributes of Allah are possessed by Allah from eternity to eternity. So when it describes Allah as the creator, that is a rational contradiction. Why? Because Allah hasn't always created. There hasn't always been a contradiction. It's also true with mercy. Mercy is a transaction and I'm complimented again. Because as the video evidence shows, Hashim's trying to co-op my argument that I've been using in the corner for nearly a year, so I'm flattered, Hashim. It obviously shows that it works. So the mercy of Allah is a transaction. The mercy of God is a transaction. Now Muslims say that Allah has always been merciful. How can you always be merciful when there hasn't always been someone deserving or needing of mercy. If I'm wrong, give me an example of mercy that is not a transaction, and then you can prove your point. But if every example of mercy is a transaction, then that demonstrate that mercy is a transaction. And if Allah has always been merciful, and there hasn't always been someone to be merciful to, you have a rational contradiction. How do we Christians get around that problem? To answer my own question that Hashim's throwing back at me. Easy. We don't say that God has always been merciful. We say that God is love and that mercy is an expression of his love. So he hasn't always been merciful, but he has always been love. The mercy is an energy of God. It's what he does in the world. I also note, and I'll ask it for the second time, that Hashim didn't address my question. In the verse of the Quran, it says that, remember when we sent an angel to Maryam, who brought glad tidings of a word from Allah 
whose name is Isa the Messiah? Why does a word of Allah have a name? If it's eternal. Okay, so I have already addressed most of the points which probably Bob did not listen to. I said, I asked him a question which he has yet answered. Why does the possession of an attribute require an expression of it? Okay, that is the question he needs to answer because he made a statement. It's just an assumption and an assertion. It is not something which we say is necessary for someone to possess an attribute and to express it all the time. In fact, I gave you an example of a man in a space station. So um, when a man goes from, from Earth to space, he obviously is someone, let's say that person is a man who is kind, a man who is just, a man who is loving, a man who is merciful. Yes? Does this man who possesses all these attributes lose these attributes because in space there are no people there? Let's say he's for the sake of argument is alone in the space station. Whom is going to express these attributes to? Does that mean he has lost these attributes? Obviously not. This argument is kind of the argument which Bob brings up about transactional. Yes, that mercy is transactional. Ask him this question. The same question will ask him. Did your God become merciful when he created a creation? Yeah. Yes. Does that become transactional now when, you, when his God is going to show mercy to the creation? So he is no different to the God that he's trying to say that Allah is someone who only is dealing with a transactional, what do you say, attribute. Where it becomes strong. It doesn't need to be because that is a condition he made upon himself. So by your own logic, your God would be someone dependent and contingent on the creation. Yeah. Because the only way he can be merciful is to create someone and show science. him mercy. No so by his own principle, he fails. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so no, again, ladies and gentlemen, Hashim avoided my question. Why does Allah name one of his words, Isa the Messiah? That's the question. I've asked it three times and I wonder if Hashim will finally answer that question. Now, let's, now I'm going to demonstrate what answering a question looks like. What does it matter if God has an attribute that he, doesn't ex that, that he needs to express? Did I get your question? Did I phrase it right? I don't want to miss it. again. Well, how did you phrase the so question? I said for possession of an attribute, it does not need to be expressed. Okay. So for possession of an attribute, it does not need to express, be expressed. Let me explain why this is a problem. But first, let me explain why it is only a problem for the Islamic concept of God. It is only a problem for the Islamic concept of God because they give 99 attributes to Allah and then say that these 99 attributes Allah has always been since before time and creation. We Christians do not give transactional attributes to God. We say that there are attributes like God is love, or God is light, or God is spirit. These are things that are intrinsic to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They don't depend on anyone except the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so God remains independent from his creation. The things that God has done in creation, we also say God has created. God is merciful. But we don't say that God has always been merciful or always the creator like Hashim has to because of what his religion teaches. He's right. Mercy is a transaction. But that means that his God, to be merciful, requires a creation to be merciful too, which contradicts another one of his attributes, that God does not depend on anything or anyone for who he is or for his attributes. So in one hand, if the attribute of Allah is that he doesn't depend on anyone for what he is, what he does, for any of his attributes, 
But then the other of his attribute is that it's merciful, he's merciful, and that is a transaction, then that means that Allah is dependent on his creation for his mercy. So answer my question, Hashim. Okay, so he's saying about the word, which uh, to, be, to be honest, actually, there was more important thing about the, about the attribute, about the nature of God, not the nature of the word of God, which in this case is a title given to Isa Ali Salam, and I believe to Yahya as well. Yes, John. So if John, John the Baptist in this case, Yahya, is also called the word of Allah. Is he going to be? No, no Muslim ever said that these people are eternal. It's a title given to them. In the Bible, it's, uh, I think the Christians call the Bible the Word of God. In the Bible, it says the eternal, the Gospels are eternal. Are the Gospels another creation of God? Yes, are they eternal? Because if you're going to use that argument, then I believe I can use the same argument for Revelation. Chapter 14, verse number 6, it says, Then I saw another angel flying in mid-air, and he had the eternal Gospel, to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Revelation 14, 6. So are you going to call the Gospels eternal and God? Okay, because if you're not going to do that, then why should you use the same argument that when Allah says a title for Isa alayhi salam, and which in Allah says in the Quran, that the likelihood, or, sorry, the similitude of Isa is like that of Adam. Okay, because when Allah, he created him from dust, and Allah said to him, be, and he became. So this is what it is. That is the reason he's called the word of, from Allah. And this is clear because he was created by the command of Allah. Without that command, he would exist. Just like he proceeded from the Father, he proceeded from Allah by his command. Very simple. It's a creation of Allah. He was caused by Allah. Just like you believe Jesus or the Son was caused by your God, the Father, who is the God of Jesus, and he's also caused the Holy Spirit. So it's very clear. I made it very clear with regards to the, uh, the expression of an attribute. And I told him very clearly, show me your evidence on which you base your principle that in order for you to possess an attribute, it needs to be expressed, which you haven't answered yet. Okay. So let me just address something that Hashim said, because he has attempted to answer my question. He's given an answer. But the verse of the Quran, if you read it carefully, it says that the name is referring to the word of Allah. Go and read it yourselves. It says, what, what, um, it's, I, I can't remember it. So though it says um, in the Quran, I think it's Ikram or Akram or Imran, Imran maybe. You have to bring it. Bob. Okay, so, so, in, so basically, the verse of the Quran says this, remember the story when an angel comes to Maryam to bring glad tidings of a word. So the word is from who? Allah. And what? And then it says, whose? Whose? That's a personal pronoun. Who is the personal pronoun referring to? It's referring to the word. So the word is what is being referred to when it is named Isa the Messiah. The word is being named Isa the Messiah. So the word is being personified, is personable and is given a name. And that's what the verse says. And what he is trying to do is to take the Quran and make it say something else. So that the one that is being named is the person of Jesus and not the word of Allah. But the Quran says the one that is named is the word of Allah and it names the word of Allah Jesus Christ. That's Messiah. That's my first point. And I want to know why Hashim it does that. Now, to answer his question, why am I, am I making a big deal about potentiality and actuality? Why is it a problem if Allah has an attribute and then expresses it at some point in time? Why is that a problem? In terms of being the creator, in terms of being the merciful, 
The reason why this is a problem is because it compromises the transcendence and impassibility of God. It turns God into a creature that changes because Allah moves from potential to actuality. I have the potential to be a father. I am not a father. I have the potential to fall down. I do, I'm not fallen down, I'm stood up. But if I become a father, or if I fall down, my state has changed. And if Allah moves from potential to actuality, then he is transient and changeable, just like his creation. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly why Christians do not attribute transactional statements to the oasis of God. Nor do we say that the begottenness of the Son is some kind of change. We say it is eternally unchanged, like a frozen picture. Okay. So a frozen picture, he says, okay, which means it doesn't change, right? Then why, when does your God become just? Does it change from being having no attribute of justice to just? Is that not a change? Does your God not become merciful when he created his creation? Does he not show mercy to anyone? Is that not a change because he never had the attribute of, of, uh, of justice or of uh, mercy or any of the transactional, like he says, attributes, which we call the attribute, the sifat al fa'aliya, which happens to be his attributes in time. So it's something that he expresses in time. He must have the attributes in order to express it. But in the case of Bob the Builders, God or the Trinity, he never has the attribute. I'm asking the question again to you, Bob, which I asked earlier. When did your God start having this transactional attributes was it later on is that not a change in nature having no attribute of justice and then becoming a judge god is the judge right when did he become the judge when he created his creation so he's then dependent on his creation unlike allah who always has these attributes remember i told you the two categories of the attributes they were uncreated that means he possessed them but he did not express them all the time, except for his essence, which is expressed all the time. So the question still remains, why does an attribute, in order to possess an attribute, why does it need to be expressed? It doesn't make you contingent if you don't express it. It's just that you don't have, right now is not the time and place to express it. Like in the case of the example of the man in a space station, he has the attribute of justice, he has the attribute of mercy and love. He doesn't express it to anyone at the space station. But when he comes back to Earth, he's going to express the, those things. When his family is going to come visit him at the space station or at the, at the center of the space, NASA, wherever it is, he's going to show them the love and the mercy and the kindness and the justice and the beauty and everything. Okay? So he does not stop, he does not stop those attributes because it is something that he has control over but in the case of the christian god he has to acquire these attributes as the creation is made that means he's dependent on the creation for being just for being merciful for being kind these are the attributes of god which he says the god did not have since eternity you know the only attribute he said the god has in the case of bob the builder are three things if i heard him correctly one is love another is spirit which is not really an attribute is in a sense okay it's something that he's made of i'm assuming and the third thing was light okay the question remains is that all the attributes the christian god possesses and the rest of his attributes like uh, justice mercy kindness all this even if it says in the bible there is a jealous god does jealousy come about when he created things whom is he jealous of all these things you have to answer bob okay so maybe hashim will return to my counterpoint about the fact that a verse of the quran states that a word of allah is named isa the messiah that the word of allah is named jesus christ 
That's the point that I would like him to answer when he comes back to me. Because if the word of Allah is eternal and a word of Allah is named Jesus Christ, then that means there has always been a word of Allah called Jesus Christ. That's the problem. Now I don't deny that other parts of the Quran contradict the implications of the verse just quoted. But this only adds to the problems of the Quran and that isn't the topic of our discussion today. We can do problems of the Quran another day. What we're talking about right now is our vision of God. And Hashim has failed to grasp a fundamental difference between Christian discourse about God and Islamic discourse about God. Allow me to try and erudite and illuminate the difference. Christians say that there are qualities, properties of God that are not dependent on anything else. God has had these eternally, without beginning, without end. I name three of them because those are the three that come to mind. I have at no point suggested that it was a complete list. It was simply an exemplary list. Like God is love, God is light, God is spirit. I haven't said their country. I haven't said it's a complete list, Hashim. So you're jumping on a red herring. Furthermore, furthermore, we believe that the transactional energies of God are not His attributes. They are things that God has done because of His attributes. So God is all powerful. God has a mind. God therefore creates. God creates because he has a mind and because he is all powerful. But the creation acts in time. So anything that is transactional is something that is not an attribute of God, not an attribute of his essence, but something that he has done because of his attributes because of his essence. By contrast, Maha Ashim will affirm, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, that the attributes of Allah, that Allah is independent of his creation, that Allah is merciful, and that Allah is the creator, are all eternal attributes. But this decries logical irreconcilability. You can't create, you can't be a creator until you create. You can't be merciful until you show mercy because these are transactions. And that means that if you can't create until you, cre you're not a creator until you create something and you're not merciful until you show mercy, then Allah's attributes depend upon creation. And that is another irreconcilable contradiction. So Islamic theology, Islamic discourse about God is self-contradictory because it doesn't have the right categories. And I am flattered that Hashim is trying to adopt a Christian language about God to defend his Islamic belief about God. I'm genuinely flattered. Okay, you can flatter all yourself, pat yourself on the back. The fact does not change. You still haven't showed us why it is illogical, why it is incoherent for us to adopt the position that in order for you to possess an attribute, you have to express it. This is what he has actually made a rule or an assumption Okay, he thinks that it applies universally, it does not. He hasn't showed us why he has made this assumption. In order for you to assert this position, you have to show us why. Give us an argument, give us something rational, reasonable that we can go by. 
instead of just patting yourself on the back that we have adopted your position. I'm questioning your position, Bob. Have you not realized this by now? Why does a person or an entity, <laughs> why does an entity need to express the attribute he possesses. You have not given us a reasonable explanation why you made this assertion, Bob the Builder. Okay, so what we have to understand now is that, by the way, if I remember, if I remember correctly, you said God creates and God shows justice or whatever attributes of this, which you call transactional attributes, they come from his omniscience. Yes, so yes, he possesses that attribute already. Hence, he can express it. And in fact, you even said it comes from his essence and his attribute. So you're contradicting your own position now, Bob. What happened to you? Have I changed you this quickly? Alhamdulillah, that is the case. That was exactly the reason for this particular debate, Bob. So I'm glad that you have actually taken that position that it, for him to express those attributes, sorry, for him to express those things like justice and so on, he needs an attribute. And for that attribute to be expressed is what comes through the creation because now he's saying that he's dependent on the creation because for him not to have an attribute of justice and then to express that attribute of justice from where does it come obviously from another attribute which you might call omnipotence i'm surprised that bob only remembers three attributes of god so i'm asking him a specific question what are the eternal attributes of the christian god i'm sure the three entities don't just have three attributes I'm sure they must have quite a lot than the ones that Allah has told us about. By the way, Allah's attributes are not just 99. He has told us about 99 attributes and names. Yes, his sifat and his names are perfect, are beautiful. And this is the reason we are able to show you that Allah expresses certain of his attributes in time. There's nothing wrong in that. However, that attribute of his was with him all the time. Allah does not need to speak since eternity. For example, when Bob goes to bed, does he stop being a merciful person? Does he stop being a loving person? Because he's not showing his love or mercy at that time when he's sleeping and snoring in bed. So the question remains, why do you make this assertion that in order to have an attribute, you must express it all the time? Okay, yes. so once again, Hashim ran away from the question. The question I asked him, I don't know how many times I've asked him, but I'll ask him again. In the Quran, it says that a word of Allah has a name, and that name is Jesus Christ. Why does a word of Allah have a name, Jesus Christ? Now, Hashim flipped what the verse actually says. It says that Allah... Allah names Jesus Christ. No, the verse that I quoted, the verse that I quoted, are you interrupting now? Yes, but you didn't No, don't interrupt, Hashim. Okay, good. Oh, we go to timing. Yeah. Don't interrupt, don't be rude. Okay, you start Control you yourself, start Hashim. Carry on. Control start. yourself. He's just rattled, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> he knows he's in trouble. Okay. The verse states that Allah has sent a word to Maryam, and then it goes on and says, Whose name is the whose is referring to the word. That's the point of the verse, which means that Allah is saying that there is an eternal word called Jesus Christ. Why does it do that? Now, to address Hashim's point, because I want to show that I'm willing to address Hashim's points even if he wants to avoid mine. Let me just remember what they were. Bear with us. Wait, 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 please. Right, so the first one is about the, the, the transactional qualities. Why is this important? Ladies and gentlemen, I simply challenge you and I challenge Hashim to give me an example of mercy that is not a transaction. An example of mercy that is not a transaction. If every example that we can conceive of is a transaction, 
then that means that Allah depends upon his creation for his, to express his mercy. In other words, he can't express his mercy without creation. And that means Allah is dependent on creation to express his mercy. That's the first problem. Because that contradicts another attribute of Allah according to Islam, which is that Allah depends upon no one for nothing, including for all of his attributes and his ability to express them. But if he depends upon creation to express his attributes, then he's not independent of the process. The second reason why it is a problem if God has an attribute but doesn't express it. Because if God has always been this thing called mercy and then expresses it in time, then this is a transition phase. He has moved between one state and another state. He is transient and changeable. These are qualities fitting of the creation, not of the creator. Now, why do these same arguments not apply to Christianity? Because we do not say that transactional qualities are the attributes of God. We say that the transactions that we see like God creating, or God judging, or God being merciful, are energies that come from the unchangeable, the non-transactional, actual attributes of God. Let me give you an example of how this works, Hashim. God was not always a creator, because creation is something that happens in time. But Hashim believes God was always the creator. How do you square that? How are you a creator before you create? How are you a father before you have a son? No, ladies and gentlemen. No, ladies and gentlemen. God is a creator. Why? Because God is all powerful and has a mind and has a will. Power, mind and will are not dependent on anything in creation. And so, he can't reverse the argument. God, is, God creating is not an eternal attribute. It is an energy of the fact that God has a mind, a will, and is powerful enough to create. These are different theologies. Mine makes sense, and his collapses into self-contradiction. Please answer my questions. Okay, so I asked him to show me the attributes of God which are eternal. He couldn't show us any, so I'm assuming he doesn't have any. Showed you three. Okay, you showed me three which I already, you said you had more. So he hasn't, he hasn't got any I more. I said mind, three. power and okay. will. Mind. See now, does God have the will to stop creating if he wants to? Yes? He can, of course. If Bob is going to say, no, then what kind of will does he have? He doesn't have a will which he can act upon by his power. So this power is of no use when you cannot will something to happen and stop something from happening. Okay? And this is where Allah and the creator of uh, the creator of the world is much more powerful in the sense that he has the ability, the power and the will to create when he wills and to stop creating when he wills. To speak when he wills and to speak, stop speaking when he wills. This is something which is not very difficult to understand. But for Bob, in order to do this, he has to invent a new word called energies. Where does these energies come from? Obviously another attribute of God, like he says, called power and will. So your God has an attribute which he uses when he wants to. You're saying the same thing in a, in a roundabout way. Because in Christianity, they have to think about the attributes of God which are not listed. So you have to make up things as you go along. Okay, so he came up with three more attributes and if they are eternal attributes, then he should have the will 
to create when he wants, to stop creating when he wants. In order to express those, he has to have the ability, which we call the attribute. You have to have the ability to create in order to express this attribute of creation. Okay? Now, if I remember correctly, he said that he hasn't got the quote. He doesn't, he doesn't have the reference number for Isa being the word of truth. Is that what you were alluding to, I'm assuming? This is in Surah Al-Maryam. In chapter 19, verse number 34, it says, This is Jesus, the son of Mary, Ibn Maryam, not the son of God. If that is not the one, find That's the reference the verse. so I can address it. That's not because the verse. you said you quoted the verse. You did not quote it. Okay, you might have, I don't know, uh, just said something similar. You might have said, uh, paraphrased it or something, but you haven't quoted. So that's what I was telling you. The reason I didn't want to interfere. JC, could you I see if you could find the verse? Ask you, but you did not quote because you claim you quoted. If you're going to quote the verse, then yes, we can tackle it. So far, you haven't given a reference. Neither have you quoted it. So let's not deal with something that you yourself don't know what you're talking about. Let's deal with something which I said and I asked you earlier. The expression of an attribute, does, sorry, the, the possession of an attribute does not require an expression. I've asked this several times now, yet Bob has no answer to that. He thinks it's contradictory in Islam to show justice. Yes, when Allah wills it, when Allah wants to, and this is what I mean by Sifat al faliya his attributes in of which he If you Google a word Allah, from Allah, yeah. But look what happens when their God, the word which we call, they call the Logos, incarnated. When he incarnated, according to Philippians 2, 6, he lost his attributes, which were all powerful. Now people can see him. In the Bible he says no one can see God and live. Not only that, Jesus, when he incarnated, the son, when he incarnated, he lost his glory. So in John 17, he asked God, he prays to God, he supplicates to God to give him the glory. What kind of a God asked another God for glory? The one who is glory less. Can you imagine a God who is glory less? Obviously, that is not an all powerful, almighty God because a God is always with his glory. He doesn't change his nature. Don't forget, glory is not a role. It is a nature. And Bob agreed at the beginning of the discussion that God does not change nature. When he becomes from all glorious God, whom you can't even see unless you want to really die, okay? This God has lost his glory during incarnation. He lost his immortality because his own creation killed him on the cross. And this God said, my God, my God, why have you, the Father, the other God, forsaken me? Yes, he has been forsaken. If the Trinity did exist, it is now broken because one abandoned the other. The God which you say is unchanging has changed from immortal to mortal. He now is become weak and he's able to die and he's able to suffer. He can be tortured by his own creation. He can be killed by his own creation. So what does that tell us? That Bob who is saying that we are the ones who are contradicting God's nature is actually him contradicting God's nature. The word which is eternal, where does it say that Jesus is called the eternal word of God in the Quran? It does not say that. Allah says many things like Baytullah, yes, the house of Allah. Does it mean that the Kaaba is something which is eternal? No, it is not. Allah says many things. Like it says in there, the camel of Allah in the case of one of the stories of the Prophet. Yes? Does that mean that camel is eternal? No. When something is used in conjunction with the term Allah, it can be like it is from Allah. Because Sorry, I'm pressing it. Hashim. It's from Allah. Okay. okay, so go let, on, let, let's, about okay, so ladies and gentlemen, let's just, let's just be clear. I don't blame Hashim from running away from my point. Hashim has been here for decades, I think, right? He, two decades, and I, he's read the Quran his entire life. Are you honestly telling me that he was unfamiliar with the verse that I'm about to quote? Of course he knew about the verse that I'm about to quote. Why did he run to a different verse entirely? Because he knows he's in trouble and he wanted to avoid it. No, this is what the verse says. 
Remember the time when the angel said, oh Mariam, Allah gives you the good news of a word from him whose name is Isa the Messiah. So the one that is named, the who, is the word. That's the one that's being referred to. Why? Because he hasn't been created yet. It's talking about the word. That's from their Quran. We'll get you the reference. Bear with us. I'm still talking. So, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Hashim went off on one about the incarnation, saying that God died. Christians have never said that God died. We say that the humanity, that the person of Christ died via the humanity. That's what we say. That's what the Bible says. That's what the council of the churches say. That's what the church fathers say. We have a language called the idiomatum, the way of speaking, that because Christ was one person with two natures, a divine nature, that took to itself a human nature, without confusion, without mingling, and this one's just for Hashim, without change. Well, the divine nature does not change, and so it does not die, nor does it suffer. But the person of Christ dies and suffers in his humanity. There's no contradiction. And if he wants to talk about irreconcilable contradictions, let me just remind him that the whole idea that the Quran becomes a material thing that you can hold in your hand, that the speech of Allah can be contained on the pages of a book is incarnational. The eternal has entered into the finite. When he recites the Quran, he is speaking. The words he believes are eternal, but the words you hear are finite. They come and they go. So he has incarnational theology in his own religion, but he doesn't have the category to describe it. I have no problem with the idea that the infinite enters into the finite. I'm not saying there's a problem there. So I wouldn't say it's a problem that the infinite eternal word of God in Islam becomes a book that I can hold in my hand. I'm not saying that's a problem. But he does. And that's the problem is that he wants one standard for my religion and another standard for his religion. And if it's wrong in my religion, it's wrong in his. I'm saying it's fine in my religion and it's fine in his. So who's got the problem, me or him? Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have to wrap up, Hashim. We've you pretty much used up our time. I think you used so, time as well. so we've used up. We have used up our time. Don't get, don't get, Marty. So what I would suggest, what I would suggest, is we limit our final statements to about five minutes and then stop. Okay. Can we just time the last five minutes? Yeah, time the last five minutes. Hashim, then me. Also, we already doing the closing statements. Yeah. You don't want me to respond to what you just said? Because we, we, we've, you can in your con conclusion, but we, we, just, we've used our time. Yeah, but or we, we could, could just stop. You can stop if you want, but I'm going to respond to what you said. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. okay. Right. Well, are you sure you don't want to do a concluding remark? No, I will do the concluding remark after I responded to you, because then you will say I didn't respond to you. Okay. Respond and then we'll conclude. But can we keep it short? Because yeah, I do yeah. have to go now. Yeah. So basically, when he compares the person, the second person of the Trinity to the Quran, that is clearly a false equi equivocation, sorry, equivalency. This fallacy is something that I need to point out because Bob needs to understand that the Muslims do not worship the Quran. Yes, you can say the speech of Allah. Yes, it's something which Allah is uncreated. The speech is uncreated. But obviously this was in time. Allah revealed the Quran in time. Allah wrote it on the, on the tablets, the preserved tablets in time. So it's something that you need to understand that the Muslims are not saying that the Quran is something that we worship. Like the way you worship Jesus Christ. Like the way you worship the Son of God. The Son of God has his own will. That's the reason when, he's going, when he was about to be crucified, he's, 
he falls down on his face and he prays to his God. He says, take this cup away from me. Yes, let it be your will, not my will. So he's showing you very clearly that in order for him, for his prayers to be answered, he falls on his face and he prays to God and he says, let it be your will. That means the will of God, the Father, is different from the will of the Son. They, they have two different, they have their own wills, they have their own self. Hence you got what? Two different entities having their own will. Does the Quran has his, has his own will? Does any of the attributes of Allah have their own will? We know that Allah is the self. Yes, He has the will. He has the ability to do things. It is not every every attribute of Allah has a will and that we worship every attribute separately or something. But they worship the Son and they worship the Father. Yes, however, what did Jesus do when he was during his ministry? He worshipped only the Father. He told others to worship only the Father. It is the Christians who made Jesus into a God, into this eternal, what do you say, entity that who is co-equal with God. But we found out that he doesn't possess certain attributes of God, like a Satan, which is another attribute you should have mentioned when I asked you, what is the eternal attribute of God? One of them is a Satan, which the Son does not have, and the Holy Spirit does not have, and they are not, co hence they are not co-equal. So I've answered your question with regards to the Quran, something that we don't worship. The Quran doesn't have a mind of its own. The Quran is something that we ourselves say is uncreated. But no one says the Quran was something that we worship. So Jazakallah khair for that. Yeah, now you can... Uh, okay, so concluding remarks. We're just going to change the battery and then we're going to stop. So, in my concluding remarks, I just want to point out that we were talking about the nature of God, we were not debating the Incarnation. I know Hashim loves to get onto the Incarnation at every possibility because the guy's a one-trick pony. Maybe a true two-trick pony after today. Let me just address his point about Jesus praying to the Father. Christians obviously believe that Christ was fully human and human beings worship God, especially if they're perfect. Christ became a perfect man, so why would he not worship his father as a man? It only continues the communion that he had with the father even before the incarnation. Hashim loves to point out what Christians believe and dress it up as if somehow he's discovered some flaw in what Christians believe. And I'll just remind you that simply stating back to Christians what they believe is not a criticism. It's like me saying to a Muslim, you think Muhammad's a prophet, as if that's a criticism. No Muslim would accept that as a criticism, so it's no criticism to me if Hashim tells me what I believe, because I believe it. Ladies and gentlemen, Hashim has never dealt with the Incarnation. He's never dealt with the, what it means for Christ to be fully human and all the implications thereof. However, that's enough about the Incarnation. I want to conclude about the actual topic of our discussion, which was the nature of God. Because what we're really talking about today is how we describe God. We Christians say that language about God is analogous. In other words, it doesn't perfectly capture who God is. But a language about God that is self-contradictory, as I've demonstrated, Islamic discourse about God to be, saying that God does not depend on his creation, but then attributing to him eternally transactional attributes that depend upon creation for their expression is a rational contradiction. If God does not depend on creation for anything, including his attributes, he does not depend upon creation to express those attributes and mercy is a transaction creation 
is a transaction. By contrast, and so much more consistently, we Christians say that transactional descriptions of God are not his attributes. They are the outworkings of his attributes. They are not his attributes, they are his energies, the things that he has done. And he has done them because of his attributes. And returning finally to where we began, the aseity of the Father and the begottenness of the Son. Hashim is trying to suggest, imply and crowbar into that discourse temporality, time, change. But none of these things apply. The monogenes of the Phila, the Son, is something that does not have a beginning in time or a beginning in space. It always was, always is, and always will be. And so, since the Son is caused by the Father, I'll stop then. Is caused by the Father, this causation should not be understood as being temporal or being finite. Okay. So Bob, can we time? Can we time five minutes? No, oh, now you have to time it. How long did it take? No, that was a, that was oh, a, you were not timing it then. No, when it came to no, my okay. turn. But I really have to go. But, but Bob, Bob I've noticed one thing. You know, I actually applauded you for being a gentleman earlier. And then you, you, you muddied that by saying that I'm a one trick pony. You know, I could have said you're a one trick pony all along. But I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to fall to your level. Okay, so anyway, I still think we had a good discussion compared to the previous times. Alhamdulillah. So let's not muddy that. Okay, because this is something that we shouldn't do when we're having interfaith dialogues. The whole idea is to establish the truth. Yes, I've told you all along that in order for God to have an attribute, it is not necessary for him to express it. Bob did not give any rational argument as to why that assumption is something that he made, that he has to express it in order for him, if he, if he possesses it, he has to express it. But then he contradicts himself by saying that these are energies which are byproducts of which come from the attributes. So eventually they do come from attributes. And these attributes are what? So justice comes from what? Everything comes from something called his omnipotence. Yes? So what is the point of all these different attributes by giving them different names? All you're doing is you're, you bunched it all together under the category of omniscience perhaps. Or sorry, omnipotence for, for example. So, for ex you, know one, you know one thing he did not say, which is an eternal attribute? It is a knowledge of God. His knowledge is something which is necessary, which his existence is necessary. So all these things are necessary and hence they are eternal. That is the reason when I mentioned, stop interrupting. When I said something like the attribute of God, which are now lost when he incarnated. I was talking about the nature of Bob because incarnation. Bob? Oh God. Bob, you want Bob, aren't you? Don't make yourself Don't. God, please. I thought we were talking about God. One, I thought we were talking okay. about God. So, <laughs> this is called narcissism for some reason. It comes to the of God now. So what I'm saying is this. If I say that incarnation is one of the things which change the nature of God, I was discussing the nature of God. I did not change the topic because the incarnation is what made their powerful God, allegedly, into a weaker God. Because this God who was powerful and all-knowing became weak was able to die by his own creation, became ignorant of the hour, for example, didn't even know when the fixed season was. Even humans know that. A farmer during the time of Jesus would know when the fixed season is because he wanted to eat figs, suddenly realized there's no figs on the tree. He curses the fig tree, which withers and dies. Okay, so this is something that is, we know that the knowledge has changed from being all knowledgeable to becoming ignorant after the incarnation. Bob went on about this surah in chapter 3, verse 54. I really don't know what he was on about because it's very clear here. This is from uh, Mustafa al khattabs translation. He says, remember when the angels proclaimed, O Mary, Allah gives you good news of a word. In the Quran, Jesus is called the word of Allah since he was created with the word B. From him, 
His name will be the Messiah, not the word. Yes, will be the Messiah. And we know he's the Messiah, means anointed one. It is it is used in the Quran exclusively as a title for Jesus. So uh, Jesus Christ, Jesus, son of Mary says, not God, honored in the world and in the hereafter. Alhamdulillah. But in the Bible, Jesus is supposed to be cursed. He became a cursed one in Galatians 3.13. Paul, Paul not only curses Jesus, became a curse, but he also says the, the Torah, sorry, the law of God is cursed. What kind of a person calls the God Almighty, the law of God Almighty to be cursed? It is only someone in the Bible who could do that. In the Quran, the shaitan is cursed and Jesus is blessed and Mary is blessed. Okay, so what we understand is that Jesus Christ is someone we Did you time in three minutes? Five, five, five. And just like they say, they use a different word, begotten. The dictionary definition of begotten is something which says existence by the by the process of reproduction. So begotten has been now removed from the modern Bibles. This is something Saint Augustine used as well. The term begotten. I have to what go kind action. of a God begets? Yes, the one who needs a son, maybe. I have to go. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul. Okay. Uh, Bob. Okay, Hashem, appreciate pleasure that. talking to you. Likewise. Have a good day. Thanks a lot. God guys. bless. Thank you. I'll do a wrap up over here, guys, for those that want to hear the wrap up. For those that want to hear the wrap up, I'll do it over here. Should I record his wrap up? Do you want to record his wrap up? Yeah, we've got record, record, record. Good. Sorry, sorry. Why does and then he says that we are the ones making God weak by saying that he depends on the creation. It is that God who depends on the creation because in order for him to become the creator, he has to create and then only becomes the creator. Without that, he's not the creator. This is the fundamental attribute, I think, in all religions, not just Christianity and Judaism and Islam. I think other religions also, the Greek religions, even the mythological Hindu and Greek religions, they believe that God is a creator. This is one of the most fundamental attributes of God. They say that God did not have this from eternity. He became a creator later on. He became just later on. He became merciful later on. To me, that is depending on the creation. Because in order for you to be a creator, to be just, to be merciful, you need a creation to do that. But Alhamdulillah, Allah has these attributes since eternity. These are his fundamental attributes uncreated attributes he expresses them in time there's nothing wrong just like i said the example of the man in a space station expresses his attributes when he comes back on earth in space he's not going to express it to someone unless he's talking on the phone or something which is different but he hasn't got someone over there let's say for the argument's sake he didn't have a phone does that mean he stopped being loving stop being just stop being kind stop being merciful no he did not so this is an absurd argument to assert that in order for you to possess an attribute, you have to express it. So Alhamdulillah, Islam, the names and attributes of Allah are perfect. Yes, Allah says Asma'ul Husna in the Quran. And these are the best and the perfect attributes and the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, Islam, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Okay, so a very quick wrap up. I like how Hashim only comes to try and address the points and throws out all of his incarnational catchphrases right at the end. That's a deliberate tactic of a debate and it's a compliment to how good Hashim is as a debater. But essentially what it means is he knows those arguments are bankrupt. The reality is that if your description of God is self-contradictory, then your religion has a self-contradictory theology. I'm flattered that Hashim is trying to copy a Christian essence energy distinction. But the problem is his religion does not permit him to do that because it says that these attributes have been eternal. And why, ladies and gentlemen, is it a problem for God to change? Because if God goes from potentiality to actuality, then that means that God is a creature. Because creatures move from potentiality to actuality. God can't transition like that. And that's why it's a problem to say that God has always been a creator and God has always been merciful. 
Christians say that God's mercy and God as creator flow from attributes. They aren't attributes, they're titles maybe, definitely, but they're not attributes. They're not something that describes who he is. It's simply a description of what he has done. But these, uh, but Muslim theology says that these, dis these 99 attributes are descriptions of who Allah is. So who did Allah create before the creation? Who was he merciful to before there was someone in need of his mercy? And that is why there is a contradiction in Islamic theology. And that is why, brothers and sisters, we can stand firm in our Christian faith. He talked about begotten. Monogenesis is still in the Bible, Hashim. You're talking about a translation. Monogenesis is still there. The idea that we are talking about some physical act is bogus nonsense. Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who are watching, Hashim uses straw men's to attack the incarnation because he doesn't understand it and for 20 years he has never understood it because all he wants to do is repeat a script that feeds an audience that want to hear the script. Christians believe the divine nature takes on a human nature and that means that that human nature can die, can sleep, can be born, can eat, can be tired. And the person of Christ experiences all of those things because of that human nature, not because of the divine nature. The divine nature is that Christ is able to raise up his own life from death, perform miracles, and was there with the Father before all ages. All those kinds of verses that Hashim likes to ignore. Ladies and gentlemen, don't be fooled by the script and don't follow a theology that is full of self-contradiction. Okay, we're going to go for a drink if you want to come, guys. Let's go, let's go. How did you find that? Because I know you debated him before. Yeah.